Welcome to episode number 47 of The Grail. I'm out here in St. Louis out doing some stand-up comedy with my good friend Bill Burr. We'll be at uh, the Fox Theater tonight, then tomorrow night Red Rocks in Boulder, the incredible world-famous Red Rocks. Can't just throw that out without, you know, giving it the fierce glory, a lifelong dream to do Red Rocks, so I cannot wait. And then Minneapolis on Saturday night, all kinds of tour dates are on DeanDelRay.com, including Los Gatos, Las Vegas, Des Moines, Iowa. A bunch of dates are up there, so check it out. Also, a bunch of new merch. We have restocked the merch. But most important, let's get into the guest today. Oh my God, this guy. Tommy Gelinas is my guest today from Valley Relics Museum. Now, let me tell you something. I often fantasize about where would I live if I didn't live in L.A. And then I think, ah, if I got there, would I be bored? Probably. And I realize I absolutely love Los Angeles. I was talking to somebody about it a couple of days ago. Yeah, people shit on it. You going to get out of there? Oh, you, you, blah, blah, blah. No, nah, man. No. Nah. Los Angeles is the ground zero of everything I do. Comedy, music, great food, killer weather, incredible architecture, all kinds of stuff. So it would be tough to leave. Yes, I do have dreams of living in Joshua Tree or Portland, Oregon or Boulder, Colorado. And who knows? It may happen one day. But when I step into a place that is like the Valley Relics Museum and it reminds me of how incredible and how rich in history that Los Angeles, particularly the Valley, is, it, it's, it, it just brings me joy. And Tommy has this incredible museum, the Valley Relics Museum, and it is just loaded with amazing history of like BMX, fast food signs, rock and roll, Malibu Grand Prix, the Bad News Bears, and even the incredible nudie suits. It is a eclectic collection of incredible history of the valley in Los Angeles. And I recommend you go see this place. It is vital if you're visiting Los Angeles to go see this man's incredible museum. Great, great guest. He has a love of rock and roll and punk rock. He also has an incredible, incredible uh, BMX collection that just makes my head fall off. Before we do get into it, I want to give a shout out to Mr. Banker Guitars. Yes, the boutique guitar building king. Follow him right now on Instagram at Mr. Banker Custom and start drooling over this man's handmade incredible guitars. Tell him I sent you. Get on the list. Get yourself a one of a kind perfect handmade guitar Karina V's Karina Explorers these are the guitars that Mastodon uses Scott from Rival Sons Blackberry Smoke Marcus King all of the great great players of this day right now are playing this man's guitar and you can too get on the list get yourself a guitar from this incredible boutique guitar builder Matt over there at Mr. Banker Custom on Instagram. All right, I hope to see you at some shows out there in the land of uh, the comedy world. This is uh, what I do. I do stand-up comedy and I do the podcast hoping to get some butts in the seat. So if you see I'm coming to a city near you, please get a ticket, come out, and watch some comedy. In the meantime, do not forget to join my patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey for all kinds of bonus episodes and the Zoom Fest, and check out the new merch on the website. All right, let's get into it. The candles are lit. This is an incredible conversation. Tommy, the owner and creator of Valley Relics Museum. Introduce yourself, my man. Yeah, my name is Tommy Gelinas. I'm the curator and founder of the Valley Relics Museum. This 
fucking place. <laughs> At a time in my life right now, I think I don't need anything. I want to try to live without collecting. I've been collecting shit all my life. But now that I look at this, I think, okay, I would love to do a rock and roll thing in this kind of a format, but only a tribute to one thing that I love, which is the Day on the Greens and the Us Festival. Beautiful. You know what I mean? So a small little thing like this is extremely large um, and very inspirational. I came here thinking I was going to talk strictly BMX with you. I am a BMX bike freak. I grew up, I raced, I, I, I rode Panda, uh, I rode Redline, I rode R&R. &R, uh, and and to, uh, as I walked into your place, uh, of course, Danny told me about it. I, uh, my, my jaw fell on the ground because I was thinking, yeah, we're going to talk BMX. But then I strolled over to a case to something that is so monumental to me, uh, Bad News Bears. 100%. And, uh, and to, to me in life, it goes like this. It goes over the edge, Bad News Bears, Jaws, The Outsiders, you know, these kind of films that fucking really shaped who I am. Uh, especially the Bad News Bears and Kelly Lee, you know? A hundred percent. And that's kind of how the museum is built. You know, it's a pop culture museum. Growing up, wasn't interested in history yeah. and wasn't interested in museums. I was kind of forced to go part of like a school field trip. And I call this history manipulation because it's the cool side of history. And what I realized that, you know, especially with um, social media, I will post something that's 200 years old, 100 years old, 90 years old, and people are like, that's really cool. But then I put a picture of a jack-in-the-box talking head menu. Unbelievable. From the 60s and 70s. Saw it. Hundreds, hundreds of comments, thousands of likes, and I started to go, you know what? People can identify with that. People actually lived it and experienced it. So what we're doing here is we're capturing the people that are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s and having a blast. But then kids that come in here with their head down at the door with their parents that are in their 40s and 50s see all the bikes, they see the neon, they see all the cool stuff, and it really enlightens them. So it's a really kind of interesting concept. It wasn't planned out. So... But you're right. You know, all the things that you mentioned are dear to me as well. How old are you? I'm 54. Do you remember Jack in a Box Bendable Buddies? A hundred percent. I have a whole collect. I have, this is about- Onion Ring Man? Of course. Yeah. This is about 40% of the overall collection. Really? So we have uh, a whole uh, sleuth of um, fast food relics. Yeah. And we just don't have the room for, you know, to put everything out. But yeah, of course- as I walked up, we're going to get into everything in here because I've got goosebumps right now, like permanent goosebumps as I saw shit. That Jack in a Box was the thing that you ordered from when you pulled up to the drive up. It'd be like, hi, welcome to Jack in a Box. Can I take your order? And you wanted to go there so you could talk to the clown. Right. Now, this is what's interesting is, you know, trying to explain that verbally over the air is one thing but actually seeing the three-dimensional you know clown head yeah. with the hat the round face that looks kind of like a golf ball you know the nose and it had the speaker and the menu and yeah i loved the fact that you could roll up and talk to jack yep but it scared kids. That's why they got rid of it. Is that right? Yeah, and I'm like thinking, I never thought of that, but someone had mentioned that, you know, they got so much heat that the parents would pull up at lunchtime or dinner time to get Jack in the Box, especially when it used to be fresh food. Yeah. You know, they yeah. would grade, yeah, yeah. like Taco Bell. It was the early in and out. Remember? Yeah, remember yeah, like really Taco was. Bell, they would cook the meat in front of you, they'd grade the cheese in front of you, chop the tomatoes up. It wasn't a bad deal. Not at all. But that Jack in the Box was just iconic. But it scared the hell out of kids. So kids I would roll up. I never subscribed to that, man. I'm never afraid of clowns. You know? I, me neither. Even during the Gacy era, yeah. I was like, wow, what a genius serial killer <laughs> to uh, <laughs> dress as clown. But clowns never scared me. I loved them. They were wacky. You go to Ringling Brothers, they get 90 of them, get out of a fucking car. You go, how did they do that? You right. know? Uh, but Jack in a Box, 
I think it was it only a West Coast uh, franchise. You know, I, I, I'm not really too sure on the history of it, but I, I do believe that there was at least a hundred thousand of them in California. Wow! <laughs> no, no oh, I'm making yeah, a joke. Say, <laughs> there was one next to my elementary school, and I could actually you could hear the speaker. Like if the school windows were open, you could hear like, welcome to Jack in a Box. Can right. I take your order well, on, a, on a, a warm day? Well, you know, you had 7-Elevens that actually started carrying the p- original Pac-Man oh. machines oh, and yeah. the right. Joust and stuff. So you had, you know, in my neighborhood, you had Jack in the Box. And then right around like walking distance was uh, the um, 7-Eleven. Right. But, you know, two of my favorite things was the, uh, three of the th- favorite things we tried besides the original 7-Eleven, the Jack and the Box, but the Taco Bell, remember they had the Enchirito and the Bell Beefer? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then Jack in the Box had the Bonus Jack. Yep, the Bonus and, Jack <laughs> and the Breakfast Jack. Right. And yeah. so... Frings, remember that? Yeah. Fries oh. and onion rings. Frings. Yeah, frings. Frings, do. Yeah. <laughs> and so that, the museum really kind of, you know, encompasses like the cool side of history and i think you know it's interesting how people will walk through here and, you know it looks really small on the outside yeah. it's not a huge museum but it's a lot bigger than most people expect yep but it's got the the neon what i'm trying to get at is that everything that's in here is from the san fernando valley and the greater los angeles area it knocks me out and so you're really stepping back into time of you know, uh, Southern California slash L.A. slash San Fernando Valley history. And what a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, the valley has taken the backseat in a lot of different aspects. It's yeah. uh, taken a beating. But back in the day, the valley was definitely rock and roll. All the greatest records were made in the valley, you know, in these famous studios. You had FM Station. Uh, and then early on, you know, skateboarding and music and yeah. Tom Petty, you know, down Ventura Boulevard, all that. Yeah. And, and I think that's kind of was the main purpose of the Valley Relics Museum. You know, this was a very rural place. People don't know that Lucille Ball, Desi Arnaz were married in Canoga Park. Their ranch home was on Devonshire. Clark Gable's ranch was in Chatsworth. His ranch home was in uh, Encino. Tarzana area, but but Encino right there. You had Bean Crosby, Bob Hope, Mary Bud Ma- Eakins, Steve McQueen, those dudes. Yeah, out Johnny here, Cash right? lived in Encino for many years. Wow. You had Marilyn Monroe went to Van Nuys. Robert Redford went to Van Nuys. John Elway out of Granada Hills. But check this out: we made fifty. Uh, six million Chevrolets out of Van Nuys. That was home of the Camaro and the Firebird from no 19. 19- shit. Yeah, they uh, General Motors produced cars in Van Nuys from 1946 approximately yeah. to about 1997. Yeah, now it's a Home Depot that area. Right, the plant. Yeah. Now Redline BMX bikes. Okay, Gary that's Little. what we're going to get into Chatsworth. Right. So you had all the earliest tracks, all the BMX manufacturers in the valley. Yeah. Then you had Marantz, Super Scope, I Fisher, got Marantz. Marantz. Right? I got a 2275 right now. Infinity. Yeah. Sarah Vega, JBL. Those were all made in the valley. Also, the speakers. Um, Acoustic? No, the other one. Uh, just sold them to my buddy. Oh, fucking, uh, uh, Roger Sound Lab, RSL. No. Oh, God. The- Sarah Vega, Infinity, JBL. Oh, it'll come. To Fisher, me. Uh, Super Scope, uh, Marantz, uh, Son of Ampzilla, which was a, a really huge power amp. Wow. But all this stuff, you know, uh, you had Rocketdyne, Boeing, Lockheed. Imagine. Also, you had that fucking amusement park where Bush Gardens. Uh, yeah, that was Bush Gardens. So that was Anheuser Busch. Yeah. And then they had Bush Gardens, which was like basically a mini uh, Disneyland yeah. or a mini uh, Six Flags Magic Mountain. Originally, just. Uh, Magic Mountain, but you had the log ride. You have live, live entertainment. It was a all that shit in there. Yeah, your parents would go get drunk. Yep, and you then could the, drink. You're right. So parents would drink, and then the kids would run off, and and, and then they'd all drive home drunk, happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no seat belts. No seat belts. So Uncle Uncle Bob would smoke. Yeah, right in the car. In the car, no seat belts. Haul Just ass. in the A track. Yeah. Get home. Everyone drank out of the hose. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. Everybody drank. Out. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I ran on the slip and slide. Yeah. They they encouraged smoking that it was good for your health back in yeah. the day. But you know the valley. You know there were so many movies made here from E. T. Bad News Bears. I'm not saying the entire movie, but but right. you know the Key bulk parts. of movies were Magnolia. In, yeah. All those. Uh, the Lone Ranger. Yeah. Uh, Nudie. The Karate Kid. Karate Kid. 
I mean, you can go on and on and on with the famous people that lived here, to the movies that were made here, to all the BMX bikes that were made here, to the cars that were made here. You know, where in the world that, were, that you could go, I don't care if it's Switzerland or New York, um, but this little place called the Valley where you had, like I said, Bob Hope, Bean Crosby, uh, Marilyn Monroe, Robert Redford, Clark Gable, uh, Barbara Sandwick, the Marx Brothers, the Warner Brothers. I mean, the list goes on it's and insane, on right? of how many people lived like in this area. So the Valley has been stripped of its history. It's not what it used to be. The Kardashians ruined the Valley to me. <laughs> that and also Hidden Hills. Yeah. Hidden Hills and Calabasas have really ruined the flavor of the valley. It became cheesy, uh, you know, let's get some uh, Ed Hardy or, uh, <laughs> right. you know, that uh, let's, let's get in some Escalades. And, uh, you know, it's just, that's what drives me crazy when people look up to the, like the Kardashians as some heroes and you're going like, this is disgusting, man. Like... <laughs> Well, I'm talking about, when we talk about it, man, the Valley, you're t exactly what you're saying. What has come out of here has been completely stripped, and it's monumental. I yeah. mean, I think the 70s, film and, and everything else, skateboarding, BMX, motocross, uh, all that kind of shit. Even amusement parks are starting to peak with these uh, new coasters are coming in and stuff. It's all valley stuff, man. You it, know? it really, it really is. You know, and and I got a lot of heat. You know, I think that back in the day, being born and raised here, is that a lot of us were inventing that sport called BMX. And right. a good friend of mine, Ernie Alexander, he's eighty years old. He's the one that started BMX. He's the one that BMX. Look at jumping bicycles, riding wheelies have been around since the day that the bike was invented. But as far as making it what it is today as an Olympic sport, not so much as what it is today. I'm not really a big fan of 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 current BMX in the sense that you're using a a, a, a wood you know track and it's just a bunch of whoop de doos. But the point is, is that all the early tracks were here, all the early manufacturers were here. Let's talk some BMX because I, it, it was such a huge, huge part of my life. BMX and Little League uh, really is what you got a combo of bad news bears. Although he wrote, a, <laughs> he wrote an AMF Harley Davidson semi dirt bike, you know, uh, right. Kelly Leak. But really, that is the era where you got on your bike, you just fucking donkey kick garbage cans, you know, you bunny hop shit, and you trash. Peel out on someone's uh You just grass. trash people's houses and stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah. On the way to- uh, It was clean, though. It was, a, it, was it, was, it was clean fun. It was good vandalism. It was just- uh, Just enough to get in trouble. But that's not what any, it is. You know, just you're enough not, to get in trouble by your parents. You're not shooting anyone. There's no e guns, nothing. No east side, west side. None of that. It's just donkey well, kicks. in the valley, that is. Right. <laughs> But what, uh, you know, have you ever, like, a course red line was made out here, and the first one I had was the square back. Yep, that and was Northridge, <laughs> which is Kitty Corner to Chatsworth. So they started out in Northridge. Um, and, and who was the guy? Uh, red line was Mike Connolly and uh, Caston. Right. And... Um, you know, they Is it part of the red line oil and all that well, and the motorcycle frames well, and it, everything? It, yeah, you had Champion and, Champion. Re and Red Line. And Red Line started off, of course, as track bikes. Right. So they were making the frames and the swing arms. And then later on, uh, Red Line, the owners of Red Line, uh, bought Champion. Right, because I looked at that champion in your case, and it was one I'd never seen. The back half was a square back red line. And it's, and it's a steel. It's a mild steel frame. It's fucking insane. Not yeah, like so, so the guy that actually did the tube cutting for Mike Connolly, yeah. which owns Champion Cranes currently today. Ooh, you can get that now? And uh, No, so that actually was up in the guy that worked. He was it was SRA. They did all the two, only tube cutting for red line, champion, uh, Robinson, Gary Littlejohn, and oh, yeah. this goes back to 73, 74. So this bike frame was more of a template. So it oh, was just made. to show you. Like well, it was actually like their prototype right. and then used as a template to cross check production. So that is actually like one of the very first frames, one of the oldest frames. 
And then from that came, you know, how they started making the more of the um, uh, a lighter weight frames, yeah, yeah. aluminum frames, well, whatever. It was nickel for a while, then they go to chromoly. And, and of course, G-Boy is aluminum and race ink is aluminum. That's right. And those things start just breaking like crazy, <laughs> right. now, you know. But those are the grandfathers of, you know. Those are the fucking frames. But too. yeah, Redline, uh, Champion, Gary Littlejohn. Mongoose, Scorpion, R and R, White Lightning, White Lightning, uh, Robinson. Those were all from here. Yeah, man. Um, uh, Robinson, and, and then you know you had these these companies that weirdly changed names too, like Pedal Power. You know, it was uh, uh, Power Light, Power Light, the same kind of thing, and then R and R, Centurion. I had the R and R Super Light. Which right. is one of the weirdest frames ever. R and R is like your your frame's way low to the ground. Yeah, we do have I one. I saw here. that one, the Centurion. Yeah, I have two. I have <laughs> I have two. There's probably two hundred bikes in the collection. Really? And then this is just a small part. Wow. So though I, I alternate them. I usually keep the valley made bikes here. Yeah. And then unless it's, you know, someone that was from here that raced, because like, you know, we we produced a lot of racers. So people like Cook Brothers and yeah. Orange County, Santa Ana companies, um, NorCal companies like A and A, you know what they did is they came here and recruited because we were basically yeah. breeding them here. Yeah. And back then, you're not thinking, well, I'm from the valley, I live in the valley, so I have to ride a valley bike. You're not even thinking not that. Not at all. So that wasn't really that. When I was riding, I didn't even realize that they were all made in LA. Right. Once Cook Brothers comes out, I start riding Cook Brothers, and what's amazing was they were double the price of every frame. And all they of a sudden were. it was known as the rich guy's bike. That's and correct. And we were dirt poor, right? But you kept your fucking eye on that bike, man. It would get stolen yeah. in a minute. Yeah, they were lighter. They were lighter. They were stronger. Like JMC is such a great bike, but they all cracked. Yeah, JMC was amazing it, with the weird fluted tube. It, and of it, course, it, you it, know. It's always interesting how it's so highly collectible. Yeah. But like everyone you try to find has been repaired. And yeah. it's, just, it's rare that you see one that's in. I just had a mint black shadow. I had a whole collection collection up till about I don't know seven years ago and I lived in a one bedroom apartment and they were just the whole living room was full of these things I was a nut job for them you know and then I eventually sold them all I just didn't want to ride them anymore you know they was just so valuable and so small you know um, but now I think it would be good just to have the one GJS, you know, and once you have your mind stuck on the one you want, then you're good to go because I just had a living room full of these things. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That's kind of what happened with me with collecting over, you know, I've been collecting local history for about 17 years. BMX, a lot of the bikes that I have, the focus was stuff that we call Cali bikes yeah. and then the Cali bikes. So I try to stay within stuff that's made locally and then focusing on the valley made bikes um but same thing as i started collecting i'm like oh yeah patterson yeah you know and then yeah. oh yeah jmc so the collection kind of grew and then i had to like downsize it a little bit to have a more of a focus of the grandfathers of bmx so bikes that were made in like 74 75 right more production driven but early grandfather bikes and then up into around 83 let's say somewhere in there yeah it's, to me it ends right around 80 right when i become a freshman in high school yeah just like the patterson's and jmc's there's a few that like linger a little bit past that 80s 82 83 yeah. but i believe that the patterson's were starting to be made by 83 uh, by gt yeah for example so, you know, keeping that focus on BMX. But and people were changing, too. Like, GJS all of a sudden had the freestyle bike. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause and they did the, 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 the sport, big tube. Yeah, the sport was starting to die down. Totally. So what they were doing is taking the BMX bikes and trying to figure out a way to revive it. Yep. And so basically. And it did, it, man, with freestyle. It brought it back. That shit it, was around, man. It's still around. What, um, did you race, uh, because, you know, uh, did you ever race at Saddleback or anything? So for me, being born and raised in the Valley yeah. is that, you know, like I said, this was a very rural place. It was a lot of farms. It was a yeah. lot of ranch homes. So we had a lot of fields. So I grew up going, racing down a place called Plummer Hill, which was behind Holmes Junior High. Right. And then behind Sepulveda Junior High was a place called the Ups and Downs. There was another place called the Ups and Downs, but right behind Sepulveda Junior High. Then below the Odyssey Restaurant. Then the Teen Center track, Devonshire Downs track, Chatsworth South, and Yarnell were all pro tracks that Ernie, the founder of the NBA, actually raced on. 
I and our crew were on those tracks 24-7. Oh. We kind of, with the racing thing, we kind of, us Valley kids kind of look back at a lot of that. And it was like the entire Valley was our backyard. By the time I was... 13 i was up at indian dunes and ascot and all you know oh, yeah. racing motocross and um so and then the bike became almost a secondary mainly as my transportation that's how i scored a sack of weed that's how i of saw course. that's how i went and saw molly or yeah, linda yeah, yeah, you know yeah so in the bike went just to went the drive-in uh, yeah, on them yeah, yeah so that? that's right so it was one of those things where uh, you know, I, I would like to tell you that I raced, yeah. but I just I just rode BMX my whole life. I grew up on that stuff. Yeah. And I got to tell you something. It was probably the first drug, you know, oh, yeah. as, and first love because if in doubt or any type of anything like let down in my life, I didn't get this for Christmas. I didn't get that for my birthday. Yep. You know, girl didn't want to have anything to do with me at a young age. I could get on that bike and ride and, and just be free, Yeah. you know, and I could always find someone that wanted to ride. And it was it's about- so true. You know, it's like Over the Edge, that right. movie. You get on your bike and you're like, fuck all you. I don't need you. <laughs> yeah, and you, you know? know, but keep in mind, I'm 50, I'm 54. Yeah. And, you know, right when I started to get into motorcycle racing and snow skiing. Roger DeCoster, Bob Hanna. Marty those guys, Smith, those Marty guys Tripes. Are, yeah. Um, Hurricane Hanna, all Hurricane those guys. Hurricane Hanna. But, you know, Right as I started to kind of get out of the riding the bicycle like an every day as a sport, um, I just started to see the first redline forks come onto the market. Wow. I would see a stingray yeah. still with the banana seat. Yep. You know, with the big crossbars that we had welded on. Yep. The grips, they didn't make them for bikes yet. So you had to use tape on one side because they were motorcycle grips. Yeah. So one side fit and then the throttle yeah. was too big. You so put you the tape, tape on it. Right. And it would twist yep. around. But I saw the red line forks, tubular forks. I saw nothing like it. And the kid's like, oh, yeah, we paid, you know, $27. And that's what a Huffy Thunder Road cost at Builders Emporium yep. was, you know, $27. My parents weren't going to buy a pair of forks for $27 oh, when you man. buy a whole bike for $39. i would get that paper route, and I would work all year, fucking paper route. And then we'd go to this place in Santa Cruz called Wes's BMX. And it was just some dude and his family owned this ultimate high-end BMX store. And you'd go in there and they'd have the GJSs. They would have the fucking Phil Wood hubs. They'd have the bullseye bottom brackets. All the good stuff. All the good shit, dude. And you would get your bike put together and you'd be ready to race. And, and I was NorCal, you know, so it was NBA NorCal. So you had McLaren Park, which is one of the scariest uh, BMX tracks in the world, man. Straight down, looking over the Cow Pass. You had Vallejo. You had Santa Rosa. You know, all these tracks all over. Sacramento, the Delta. And then everybody raced. And then the finale was at Saddleback in L.A. 100%. You know? and, and, and it was one of the biggest biggest saddleback grand nationals ever you know it's absolutely just, it was like right after that stuff that's on joe kid and the stingray that yamaha shit that was at the la coliseum you know did yep. you watch joe kid on stingray yeah, what a great flick what a great flick man. and you know what's interesting about collecting is that since i grew up riding bmx bikes and i watched that whole sport like right from the beginning yeah. you know just me riding a stingray converted you know you cut down the seat post too, you yep. tuck them underneath you know, you put on the girl bars, you know, because they were shorter. You weld the bar on that. A lot of the stuff that the manufacturers came from the homemade jobs that we made here in the Valley. But, you know, starting to collect and having the museum, I became really close with the early found, the early writers like the Harry Learys and the Stu Thompsons yeah. and all those people. Stu's a cop now. He is, a sheriff. So crazy. I tried to get him on the show. He said he would do it, and then his parents were sick and, and everything. And then what's the other guy? Uh, Perry Kramer got him on the phone a couple of times. He's kind they're of They're here. They take. come. They come yeah. to the reunion. Yeah, yeah, They'll yeah. be here. Yeah, they but were. they're great, great guys. And he's yeah, they're great. Perry's out there still riding, still yeah. killing it. And, yeah. Uh, but, you know, I've learned a lot from these guys. So through collecting and research and building, you know, like I said, there's, there, I just have tons of BMX bikes. What do you it, think that uh, champion frame's worth in your case there that's half, uh, uh, like, uh, 
you know, it, it's it's hard because there's a lot of people on there that you know, especially BMX guys. They're they're really assholes. Oh, I mean, they are right. You know, and a lot of them are in their 40s and 50s. Yeah. They definitely can't ride a wheel anymore. Not saying that I can. Yeah. But the point is, is that. You know, a lot of them are looking in retrospect because when we built bikes, we used whatever we could. A lot of my friends that did race and got sponsored, they rode what they needed to ride as part of their sponsorship. So looking back, I can go, well, you know, a Cook Brothers this and a Raya this, yeah. you know, and Phil Wood this and, you know, uh, Pro Neck this. And I can tell you that, you know, this is how a bike should be built. Yeah. And to some degree, some of those bikes were built that way. But a lot of us just, it was a mishmash of whatever we could get and whatever didn't break. And, you know, we got those three piece cranks and we would fuck those things up. Yeah. So we would go back to the single piece for racing because they were more durable. I would go Dura Ace. And then if you could really be a baller, you'd get camp, Campanella, uh, Campanola. Yeah. You know, yeah. like Campanola cranks, you know, Absolutely. some Italy shit, you know, yep. something taken off a of Bianchi. Yeah. You know? and, and that stuff today, you know, so you'll see something like a frame like that yeah. where, you know, to me, all this stuff is priceless, you know, because there's you. not too many of it. You know, I know some collectors, uh, most of those collectors would go, you see that guy on eBay? He's ridiculous. He's trying to get $2,000 for a JMC frame. Yeah. And I go, I know it's ridiculous how much that stuff's worth. He goes, well, anyways, I'm here to sell you something. And I go, oh, what do you got? I got an original, you know, original frame, this, this. I'm like, what do you want? He goes, I want six grand for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so they're kind of like. Well, they think you're a museum and, you, you know, he's got but, big deep pockets. But, but yeah, people are crazy. And, and here's the, the thing about that once all of us die millennials don't give a fuck about they really this vintage don't. bmx stuff they yeah, don't give that's a why a museum if if a museum can stick around long enough to hit a point where they're breaking even yeah with an endowment and with a good strong board you know it's it's not the size of the museum what i realized you know and it's not so much what the subject is not in other words there was a guy that spent millions of dollars in some midwest town up in the hills not too far away from a busy town and he made a farming equipment museum right put a lot of money and no one showed up because the subject was terrible right now, i'm not saying it's not cool yeah but, you know you just couldn't get anyone of any age up to look at farming equipment but it was like a certain type of farming equipment so the point is you can take a smaller setting of items that are more interesting. Yeah. And like the, what is it? The death museum, the yeah, murder yeah. museum, oh, the ice cream it. museum. Yeah. Yep. So a lot of those guys do well, not only through marketing, uh, but it's engaging. Well, and so we're, 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 what I'm trying to get at is you're right. You know, and a, a lot of the matter of fact, people come in here and they go, you know, I'm, I'm in my seventies. I have all the stuff that I've saved. It's family photos from the 1800s of the Valley. I have antiques, artifacts, signs and things. And you know what? I try to give them to my kids and they don't, and, and their kids are in their forties and fifties. And they're like, no mom and dad, I don't want this crap. We don't have the room for it. Yeah. And they're saying our grandkids don't want it. Our kids don't want it. I'm so glad you're here because now we found a home for it. But it's a shame that a lot of the millennials and some of people in our age, you know, I think when you get into your 40s and 50s, you start to have a, a different appreciation for it. Museums are coming back due to the subject matter. Yeah. But you're right. Well, uh, it's passion, man. I think that the, uh, the computer has really taken away passion. And uh, not to sound like some old man or whatever, <laughs> right. but what I'm saying is when you're, when you, if you're somebody that grew up without a computer, you, you were out doing something. If it was skateboarding or if it was going to a movie theater, actually with your friends, waiting in line for an hour and a half to see Jaws or, or sleep all night in a cold line to get a ticket to see Kiss or or, you know, get up at 4 a.m. to drive to a BMX track. You, you become passionate about something. And with the computer and the click and move on era, there's not a lot of passion. No. And when I walk into this place, it was making the hair on my arm stand up. One of the things I Thank saw. You. And as I look at stuff, I go, boom, wow, what happened? One of them, Malibu Grand Prix. Let's talk about it. You actually have a Malibu car over there. Yep. And you have like a Malibu looking employee. He's wearing the jacket and all that. At one point, there was go-kart tracks all over America with these shitty little homemade go-karts. And then somebody 
decides to open these high-end joints. You got to be 16. You got to have a car license to drive. And there were these tracks where these cars could go 60 miles an hour. You could never get them up to that because it's all turns. Mm. But it was rad as fuck. And, you, and man, these things were humongous for a while. Yeah. So another, uh, some more Valley trivia yeah. is that Malibu Grand Prix was, um, you know, Malibu Grand Prix Incorporated uh, started in Woodland Hills, California, down the wow, street. Wow, no shit. First and, track? Oh, yeah. And, and the, the tra first track opened in Northridge, but they had a track, a testing track, in the back of their warehouse in Woodland Hills. And the owner was from Malibu. Wow. So he called it Malibu Grand Prix. And the corporation was uh, started in Woodland Hills, and the, they came out in the like 70, I want to say 76, 77, right around that time. I have that particular race car, the miniature Formula One car, is a 1976, 77. I have a 1980 uh, Malibu Grand Prix that's being restored right now. Wow. But I have thousands of tokens. They were a Malibu Grand Prix license that you got from Malibu Grand Prix. I got three of them. Right. So, I got all three. So all three. And one of them, I'm shit-faced in it. <laughs> and if you look at it, because they used to be next to Oakland Coliseum. If you, in, if in you search Malibu Grand Prix license, uh -huh. uh, there's on Google is uh, Michael Jackson. Really? Yeah, so you're one of the first ones, Michael Jackson, Malibu Grand Prix license. Wow. So yeah, everyone, it's funny because people have donated them here. Yeah, yeah everyone, I, got, I got three of them. I would be boozed up from these like concerts at Oakland Coliseum and uh, Malibu would be open late so you go see like Van Halen. And then you go in there and be right. They, no, no breathalyzer or anything. Right, yeah. Just they, gassed up. You go, yeah, let me and, get six and, laps. So what they did is they, they the way they started that car there's a positive and a negative yeah. coming off the bumper, yeah. right? And then they hooked up, you know, basically like jumpers, yep. started the car, and then in the back, they had a toggle switch. They had two switches. So if you were acting up, they could walk over to the car and toggle you off. They had no reverse, and they did. They turned not too sharp, no. and they governor, They put like a governor on them. Yeah, they did. So they were, they were basically snowmobile motors. Yeah. So they did. They got up to 50, 60 miles an hour, but there was a lot of turns. But man. Do you know how many tracks uh, by the... They, they became a franchise. Right. And I know that they ended up opening one, you know, a several throughout like Orange County, San Diego. There was one in Grand Rapids. There was one in Fresno. Uh, yep. So there, there was, since it was a franchise, I believe there had to be, you know, over 10 to 15 of them. Um, and then they slowly started closing. Now, it, now it is um, it's Malibu Amusement wow. Incorporated. Still and, around? Yeah, and they own the golf course right there in Sherman Oaks. Oh, that one. So that that's one. a Malibu. Ca it's called Malibu Castle. Oh yeah, Entertainment. That place. Yeah. So Malibu Castle Entertainment is still around, but they've got away from the um, uh, from the go karts. Wow, man, it's so crazy. Now, where did you get the cars at? The car, uh, long story, I've been searching for those things, just like we do with the bikes and stuff. And I had some people looking out for me. And, you know, you look on all the different Craigslist and eBay, and uh, you see ones beat up, ones that have been converted, ones right. that have been changed out. And a friend of mine, actually the vice president of our board, uh, found one up near San Diego. And the guy had bought about five of them and was restoring them and then wanted to get, you know, after he realized they only go about 50, 60 miles an hour, he wanted to move up to a real Formula One car. Oh, so, he, so he slowly started selling them off. So I got the first one, you know, the 76. He didn't tell me he had five of them. Yeah. So I bought the set in 1976, 77 one. And then, you know, I had saved his, his deal and another one popped up. And I'm like, it's the same dude. Right. And then I bought two. And then another one that I didn't know he had, the one that he had kind of was the, the main one. The that crown was, jewel. The crown jewel that he had kind of stole all the parts from and made one perfect, complete. Uh, he, had, he put it on eBay. And I won the auction at two grand. Yeah. And he got so pissed that I had three of his cars that yeah. he had paid a lot of money just to get them from wherever you know, the shipping and the restoring right. and all that stuff that uh, he actually wouldn't ship me the car. Really? <laughs> yeah. I was like, I just left it alone. He's like, you know, man, I, I'm really, was really upset. I put it up there not thinking. With and, no reserve. He's thinking he's going to get like 20 grand or something. Yeah. And he goes, and I just feel ill the fact that, you know, I paid all these money and you're going to end up with three of them for half of that cost. Wow. And I just, nobody I, wants those. You know, I just go, dude, whatever. I'm wow. like, you know what, dude? 
I, normally I would just leave you a negative result because I hate people to leave negative results no matter yeah. what. Yeah. So no. But uh, anyway, that's my Malibu Grand Prix story. But that's another local company right that's out incredible. of the valley. That's incredible. Let's let's get into a little bit of the bad news bear. So um, I, as I walked around in here, like I said, everything was knocking me out. And then I get to this fucking case that's to the left of us here. Uh, of course, I saw the... Uh, uniform over on the other side but as i get to here we're talking about one of the stars of the movie uh toby, toby. and you've got his his uniform so you've got his script you've got stuff from the actual dugout and all that shit where did this come from and uh, unbelievable crazy right yeah so that was a danny boy from house of pain danny, yeah. the coca dostra hookup so he became friends with David, the you Toby. Know, Toby. What's uh, that's the actor's and it, name? And I believe in David. Forgive me if for any reason you were ever to hear. I think it's Stramoff. Stramoff. That's his last name. Yep. And right. um, so Danny uh, said, "Hey, you should do a deal where you do a meet and greet at the museum. You know, it was filmed at Mason Park, right down the street. Right down the street. Yes. Wow. And so when I talked to David over the phone, he says, "You know what? When I was in that movie." My mom went up to the producer and the directors and anyone that was anything to do with that movie and said, hey, uh, and she was collecting photos and already. Right, she was right. collecting everything. Yeah. She was so excited that her son was in this of movie. Of course. I'd be the same way if I was in the movie. Right? I'm like that. Like, I, I'm in one movie. And, and <laughs> right. I mean, I'm in a bunch of movies, but the first one I was in, I grabbed everything, you know? Right. So the mom's like, hey, what are you going to do with, you know, like these, you know, props and this and that? They're like, why? Yeah. And she's like, well, my son's in it. I just want to keep. So she made a deal and ended up getting everything from the Tommy Martindale, you know, signs to the home team to the scripts and photos and outfits. And so the mom saved that. And as David grew up and moved on, you know, he um, became like a pastor and uh, did a lot of good with getting the churches to accept gays into the church and things like that. That's amazing. Is and, he gay? Uh, I No, he's married. Right, right. And so, but he really fought for like... That's awesome. Yeah, cancer uh, victims and gay people and, and human rights in the church and, um, and has done really great work. Recently moved out to New York. Um, but he says, you know, Tommy, it's like... Um, I came here and I see the place. My mom got all the stuff. She, it's been in storage for years and years. And, you know, the f f movie was filmed here and people are enjoying it. And he goes, you know, it's just hiding underneath, you know, and, you know, my mom had it in her garage, you know, and, and he's got to be in his like late forties or early fifties, right. probably early fifties. And he's like, it belongs here. And, you know, I'm going to give it to you, like, permanently, as long as you keep the museum open, as long as you keep doing what you're doing. He goes, I might ask for my jersey back, but I doubt it. Right. I really, I moved to New York. I really don't have the room, but it belongs here. Unbelievable. And, and so, you know, and those are the thinkers. Those are the, the, for, the people that can foresee the future. It's kind of like uh, when I was a kid, you know, I saved that little box of gyms, you know, yeah. the little things that yeah, my me grandpa too. The gave $6 me. $6 million dollar man. Right. My evil Knievel. Everything else yeah. kind of went away, but I always save that one box. It's slowly depleted, but yeah. I saved that one box for all those years. That's what mom did with all the props, and Danny Boy hooked that up. And uh, that, that, when you look at that jersey, it's like a punch in the face if you're our age and you, I mean, that movie was so iconic and it really so was. outlaw. Yeah. I mean, to see kids as real kids, because kids were always portrayed like Brady Bunch and stuff, but the second parents weren't around, they're like, fuck you, right. asshole, <laughs> yeah. fuck it, you know, smoking cigarettes, trying booze and weed, and going to the arcade, and, and robbing the arcade, and doing whatever they <laughs> Putting your hand up in the Coke machine, trying to get that always, Coke. Always, yeah, pull the fucking Coke machine down. You know, I used to do this thing called the penny trick, where you could put the penny on the bottom in the coin slot and flick it up, and you could get games. People right. were mind blown by that stuff. Yeah, or you can shave the, actually you take a nickel, I think, or yeah. a quarter, you know, it's a nickel, and if you shave it down with your foot, scrape it against both sides. Yeah. For some reason, by taking the edge off the machine, the arcade machines couldn't recognize it, so it actually mimicked it as a quarter, a quarter. or a nickel. Yeah. So we would shave down the side, just put it on the ground, take your shoe, and rub it back and forth. Just scrape both sides, and you know we'd put five nickels in there and have five games versus yeah. you know that's how you got good at, at, at pac-man and asteroids and space invaders you know and 
and all that because well, my every- parents knew back then. You yeah. know, you want five dollars for? I'm not giving you five dollars to throw away. Yeah, like it's not happening. You're yeah. not getting five dollars to throw away. So you had to get really good and make that quarter last, oh or God. shave down nickels. Yeah, or slugs. It's amazing slugs. It's amazing it's, slugs. Where- Think about slugs for a second. Slugs. Like, they invented that for kids. Like that's yeah. the best thing next to marbles. Like who in the fuck would? figure that a slug would actually work in a parking meter and an arcade game it's crazy (laughs) but that's the kind of stuff that bad news bears really showed you know and it showed that kids were uh they were they were learning to survive man but it made it more it was just more realistic you know it wasn't so candy coated but to see that 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 jersey right there with the little bear logo on the hat crazy right and u.s bail bonds or whatever their sponsor was chico's bail bonds chico's bail (laughs) bonds you know you look at that shit man and it's just so unbelievable that film, I, I never even saw the new, the, the repop. Me neither. So the guy that, okay, so Shane Butterworth played yeah. in the TV series. Right. And so he was a young child actor. He saw this and says, you know, I was in the TV series. And, you know, everyone knows that this is the OG original one. But he goes, I'd like to donate that. And, you know, the one thing I realized that here when you come to the museum, you see the Palomino sign from 1949. I saw that. Where every country western act had played Ever. and got their start that's yeah. like bonnie Raitt. yeah uh you know linda ronstadt the Stevie flying Ray burritos played there. Yeah. yeah the flying burritos yeah. brothers got their start there that was the country western music hub from is that the still 50s. open no closed when did it close closed many years ago that's been closed since like 90 i want to say about 94 95 right. maybe 97 but that opened in like 1949. I remember that it was just a straight country, co- you know, country bar that had live acts. If if you look at the history of the Palomino Club at North Hollywood, that people were coming from Bakersfield, from the East Coast, the West Coast, like that was California's mu- country music hub. Yeah, and every famous act in their early, early, early stage before they became big played there. I have contract it was the whiskey a go-go of of country country, 100 percent. so we have all of the signage i have contracts from the 60s and 70s it was the very very first country club to ever get a country western music award wow Uh, and that was in 1962 i have that sitting over there in the counter wow now where where'd you get that stuff the old owner so the sign was donated. Uh-huh. Uh, I looked for about 10 years to figure out where the Palomino sign. I saw it on MySpace. A friend of mine standing next to it, I called him and said, where's the Palomino sign? He goes, it's gone. He wanted to make everyone think that it was his. Yeah. Um, he just got a picture next to it. But he eventually told me it was gone. It was in a museum. People said it was in the trash can. It was scrapped. He just made up stories? Made up, everybody did. No one knew where it went. One day I got a phone call. It says, hi, my name's Scott uh, McNatt. And uh, I have something you might want. I saved all the Palomino signs from destruction. I have them all. And would you be interested? I called them back and I go, oh my God, like I've been looking for these for 10 years. I go, where are they at? He goes, oh, in a warehouse outside, uh, two blocks away from your museum. Whoa. <laughs> so I rescued them. Yeah. I redid the neon. I yeah. left them as they are yeah. and lit them up. I mean, the Chili Peppers played there. Pennywise, towards yeah. the end. Of course. When, it t- became punk rock towards yeah, the end. Yeah. yeah. When yeah. Tommy Thomas passed away, the kids, the wife and kids took it over. And they started bringing in some really big, relevant, more, you know, bigger acts like the Chili Peppers. Right. And, um, and the Pennywises and stuff like that. The, unfortunately, it only held 290 people. And, you know, North Hollywood's never been that pretty. What's the other joint out there right now that's country still? Um, you have, right down the street is the um, the uh, Cowboy Palace. Yeah, The yeah, Cowboy the Palace is right Cowboy here. Cowboy Palace. But you had the FM station that was originally the Ragdoll, and then it was also Haggard's, Merle Haggard's spot for a minute. FM station used to be Merle's place? Yeah. I only know FM Station, Filthy McNasty, of course. He had the Viper Room for a long time, then he moved well, to the Valley. Right, so it was it was originally Filthy McNasty's was at what is now the Viper Room, which right. was originally. Right, exactly. And then he moved, and then uh, he got in trouble because Filthy McNasty, he was going to get sued for using that name because that's a character name that's copywritten. Oh, really? And then that's why they called FM it FM Station, Filthy McNasty. So when you say that people are, F, there's an FM station? Like yeah. there's a radio station yeah, in the yeah, Valley? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I uh, played there. Yeah. That's so long ago. Speaking of, speaking of that, yeah. uh, 
So a friend of mine, a new friend of mine that we just had the same conversation. He used to race BMX. He just donated a bunch of trophies. He raced when he was 10. Oh, wow. Kevin Starr from the Zeros. Wow. Now he, he played later yeah, on the drummer. Yeah, my boy's Danny. Yeah. Well, Danny Dangerous. He's the sound man at the store. And uh, he was the bass player in, in the Zeros. Right. And now Kevin Starr uh, races side hacks for Jay Leno. Side hacks. So he races like the real deal side, motorcycle side. Oh, I got racing. you. Oh, I got you. That's crazy. So he's like, you know, like me, he's like six, six, five, yeah. long black hair. Yeah. You know, still looks like a rocker. Looks yeah. like a complete, you know, like he's never left 19, you know, 86. Yeah. Yeah. And really nice guy. And, um, but, uh, you know, the, the FM station, remember, the, like, I'd see bands like uh, Legs Up, Liquor oh, Sweet. That was like Warren's Place. Yeah, and uh, Shark Island, all these the bands. The Brats. Yeah, all those bands played there. It was really uh, unbelievable because you're only 15 minutes, 20 minutes from the whiskey, but it was a whole nother world. You're going into the valley. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and it's yeah. interesting. I used to walk in there and see the dudes from, like, Fate's Warning yeah. and... Uh, all these obscure like um, metal blade bands and stuff like that playing there. Lizzie Borden. Yeah, give them the axe. Give them the axe. Yeah, yeah. give them the axe. Like yeah. Reseda Country Club, uh, all oh, those dude, fucking places. The Reseda Country Club. So the Landises, yeah. the son donated. I have a Chuck Berry. It was in the green room at the Country Club. So the Country Club was in Reseda. Right. It was originally open. He owned they, that family. The Landis's opened the Largo Club on Sunset, which is now the Roxy. So they own that. Wow. And it was one of the early burlesque clubs. Right. I mean, like early on. And then they bought, in the 70s, they bought, which was a huge save-ons, and turned it into a country club. Right. Like the Palomino. Didn't really take off. It's in Reseda. Didn't really fly. So Wolf and Riss Miller, Us Festival and things like that, yeah. those promoters actually... Um, became the um, tenant. They wow. leased the club. They kept it the Reseda Country Club. Yeah. So um, once Wolf and Riss Miller took over that, there, you know, I saw Oingo Boingo, uh, Celtic Frost, Testament, Slayer. Oh yeah. Circle Jerks. Slayer, man. In the Valley. Yeah. He in had the one Valley. Mega Death. Yeah. And across the street from the country. Merciful Fate played there. Dude, I, I saw so many bands there. But then you had the Chuck Berries playing there. Yeah. You had. It was such a great venue. Oh, it was um, famous, dude. A Motley Crue. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody played there. And uh, KMET did all of their broadcasting there and their after parties there. So you had KMET always posting up there. You had all the best bands playing. But there was a place across the street. Oh, uh, the punk rock joint? Yeah, called Antennas. Yeah, Danny was talking about that. Antennas. Like, like they'd just go over there and fight people and shit. Yeah, so, yeah. so Antenna is a guy basically uh, graduated uh, Vidal Sassoon in England, moved out to Studio City and opened one of the first new wave punk rock hair salons in Reseda. Yeah. And people lined up, came from all over Southern California yeah. to um, get their beehive done, their mod Beatles look. Yeah. It was crazy. A lot, of people, a lot of people remember that, a lot of people don't, but kind See, of we're, interesting. We're constantly talking about just great stuff from the Valley. And yeah. it's like you said, man, it's very sad that it's uh, had its soul stripped out, man, you know, and um, it's it's and it's amazing to be in here because as I look around, I go, you're right, man. I've shit on the valley forever. And I realize the valley is such a big part of my childhood. And it was so amazing. I just shit on what I know of it now. You right. know what I mean? Uh, extreme heat. No soul, a, a lot of bad yeah, McMansions and, you know, yes. all that horribleness. But it really, really is um, a, an amazing place in, in Los Angeles. And uh, it's as bad as I think it is. I still think it's way better than Orange County. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you're, you're right. And I think what has happened is over the years, they came up with what they called neighborhood councils. And the neighborhood councils before the little communities like Panorama City actually, you know, Panorama City is so bad uh, crime wise, but we had the Broadway, Robinson's, Orbox. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of stuff cruising Van Nuys Boulevard. But what happened over the years, the communities did not know how, depending on what council member took over, they didn't know how to go about getting money and certain things for the individual communities. And, you know, places like Burbank and San Fernando early on disassociated themselves 
by becoming their own community. Yeah, right. And we didn't do that, our little communities. So we're the hand that feeds LA. Our revenue is so large. Now keep in mind, you know, for Los Angeles, the mission isn't in LA. Right. It's in the valley. Right. And Mulholland brought the water to the valley which feeds LA, which is in the Valley. But what happens is the revenue is so high that they refuse to like divorce us yeah. because they need it. They yeah, need yeah. us. But what has happened is the neighborhood councils now are going in and the council members are learning how to fight to get our communities. You know, they're working on the, the homeless uh, issue. They're creating new laws. So the McMansions, that there's certain laws in places. So what they're trying to do is now kind of since it's been stripped and it's been neglected, now you see a little bit of more of those Grove type place, you know, opening up. Yeah, yeah. They're starting to build better communities. And I look at it like a crust. Like when you go to like Studio City or Tarzana or Encino or Woodland Hills, and then obviously Chatsworth is all still very cowboy Western along the rocks. Yeah, I love you know, that. You know, and then you go to Porter Ranch, Gas Leak, whatever. Oh, yeah. But those houses, you know, are all, it's, they're nicer communities regardless uh, they made it look nice. So you kind of look at the crust of the valley. It's all that stuff in between like Van Nuys and yeah. Reseda has really been uh, dilapidated. But now they're getting funding like NoHo Arts District. All of a sudden now great. it's got a nightlife. They got clubs. Yeah, they got shopping. Yeah, it's great there, man. So the valley finally has put so much pressure on L.A. to like, look, we need a divorce or start giving the money. that See, like they're paying revenue. But we're supposed to get that also given back, kind of like we do with taxes. You right. know, we pay taxes, and at the end of the year, we get some of that back. So now we're fighting for it. So they're trying to they're trying to heal the valley. It's going to be a process. It's going to take a while. They're putting transportation back in the valley, like the Orange Line. You know, they want to put the uh, trolley back up Van Nuys. They're they're starting to keep an eye on some of the, the little historic buildings that are left. So I'm I'm glad that they're finally doing something about it. I moved up into a little unincorporated part of LA called Stevenson Ranch. Oh yeah. So I'm up in the hills and there's lots of- Is that of, the Manson era? Uh, that, area? That's Porter Ranch. Oh, gotcha, Porter Ranch. Yeah, I'm Ranch. away from the gas leak. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm up going more towards Valencia. You what, know? Uh, now let's let's get into it here. Uh, I want to wind it down here. You're only open on Saturdays. So it's free every Saturday. It's free? Yeah, so every Saturday we're here from 10 to 3. It's free and it's fun for the whole family. We do a lot of events throughout the year yep. and how we keep the doors open. A lot of major clothing brands do their photo shoots here. Oh, no shit. And so, and they're, they're doing a lot of that. And in the back, there's a whole big area where we've done punk rock shows, art shows, oh, food wow. trucks. Wow. Um, a lot of people rent this out for their 50th birthday parties, 60th birthday wow. parties. So that big back door opens up. The yeah. $400,000 nudie uh, mobile, we pull that out, all the arcades. The are nudie free mobile? Yeah. Oh, oh. So nudie was the famous who, rodeo was, tailor. The country suit. He's, he's the one that did Elvis Presley. I just Presley's. met his assistant. He's still going. That's probably Manuel. That's that him. Worked, that just, worked underneath nudie. I just met him at the Marty Stewart show. Probably, yes. Yeah, and he's still making clothes, man. Yep, so Nudie passed away. Yeah. he. We have a lot of his store artifacts that were in North Hollywood. Like, Nudie outfits today are yeah. like, you know, minimum three grand up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's because unbelievable, because right? He just made... He, Burrito Brothers, all those guys wearing he, those. Did you know that he made the Lone Ranger's mask? That he, was his He tale. did? Oh, yeah. Whoa! Uh, Elvis Presley's gold May suit. He made, for every country western act, every country western... Western, he's the one, matter of fact, uh, the Electric Horseman, that's, you know, right. he, he was the first guy to bedazzle and embroider cowboy Western suits and make them look like rock stars. Think about a cowboy back in the 30s and 40s. They were dirty and they were rolling around yeah. with, a, with a bandana tied around their neck, but they were dirty. With Wranglers and a fucking, yeah. And he took the, the uh, Roy Rogers type of cowboy and made him look like a rock star. Yeah. He turned him into rock stars. Hee haw, man. Cleaned he, it up, made it fucking rad. Where, you know, where kids could worship those guys, yeah. you know, and go, you know, you had uh, Dell Evans, Roy Rogers, I mean, on and on and on with these cowboys. And so he bedazzled them. That's amazing, but he, man. He and so what, the nudie mobile is the car? Yeah, so that, that car is, I believe, a 64 
Uh, I saw it back there with the guns on it and shit. Yeah, it's a four hundred thousand dollar station wagon that he made for his daughter. Whoa! So four hundred thousand dollars? Yeah, the Kid Rock bought one of his cars, uh-huh. the red Cadillac convertible, for th- I think two hundred seventy five thousand fifteen years ago. The last one, which I think was um, Roy Rogers, uh, not Roy Rogers, Monty Montana's went for, I think, 400000 This is an early one. He made that for his daughter, and when he brought it home, the daughter was probably 16 or 17, completely thinking cowboys are ridiculous, yeah. right? You know how kids are. Yeah. Like, Dad, I don't want you yeah, to drop That's me. your stuff, Dad, yeah. not me. So he comes home with this car with embroidered seats, guns, a big horn on the cover, on the front, and she says, Dad, that's ridiculous. I would never drive it. Oh, no. So um, he kept it. It went on some parades. It eventually, uh, Oil Tycoon in Canada bought it. Yeah. Went into, went into auction. He bought it. All these years later, the granddaughter, so the granddaughter, that means the mom that didn't like the car. Yeah. The one that wouldn't drive it. Yeah. Well, her daughter, she passed. Then her daughter that inherited all of the nudie um, stuff found out that her mom's car was in Canada. She called the oil tycoon and said, hey, um, you have my mom's car. And he goes, mom's car? He goes, yeah, my grandfather was Nudie Khan, the famous rodeo tailor, and he made that for my mom. And you have my mom's car. Yeah. I want to come see it. He goes, I'll tell you what. Send me a dollar and I'm going to send it back to you. Whoa, really? And now it's in the museum. Wow, so she deno- donated it? So it's, it's here. She's donated a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, this is here on a permanent loan. Wow. Um, it could technically leave at any of course, time. But how but cool is that? Yeah, it's been here for four years. We had two of them. We had the, uh, the Cadillac as well. That made its way to Nashville. They took yeah. the engine transmission out and they put it on the wall at the nudie honky tonk, right. the world's longest bar in Nashville. But um, yeah, we have all kinds of nudie art- artifacts here. And you got uh, pinball, you got kiss. Yeah. Of so course, uh, now do you have a collection of them? Because some of those in the seventies, uh, I, I really love the Ted Nugent one. And we the Rolling we have one. about a hundred arcade games. Really? So uh, uh, what's his name? Richard Foos uh-huh. of um, Rhino Records right. recently donated about 50 grand worth of 1940s, 50s, up into the 80s. He donated the Elvira, Rolling Stones, um, a bunch of uh, other stuff that's not here yet. And then a guy that opened up the Family Fun Arcade 40 years ago. He um, really well known in the industry for being an innovative guy. He owned uh, four major arcades in the Los Angeles area. Recently started, he closed down the one in Tokyo Town and then the one that was in Granada Hills for 40 years. He closed down about five years ago. He donated uh, the original Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat. Wow. And those are like the super birds. Those are yeah. like. Yeah. So, yeah. So we have, you know, it's like it is. It's a, it's a trip down memory lane. And I think anyone, what's cool about this, kids that are 10 years old, the people that are in their 70s and 80s. Oh, just anybody have a blast. would love this shit, man. Just to just come in. And I mean, so come down to this place. I'm so glad I came here today because I've been trying to come here for a year. And, uh, and, and do you have an Instagram? I do. So first of all, if you go to um, Valley Rec, excuse me, valleyrelicsmuseum.org, um, all the information's there. Um, we're open every Saturday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, admission and parking is free. Also on the website, you can sign up for a newsletter. We do a lot of vintage car shows, motorcycle shows, like a lot of cool stuff. Stuff that's usually 90% of the time it's free to the community. It's always fun. Um, and then we have an Instagram, which is, you know, uh, Valley Relics Museum. Right. Um, you know, you just search Valley Relics or Valley Relics Museum. But we do have a great uh, informative Facebook page with lots of old photos. Yeah. Um, and then of course, uh, the Instagram and yeah, we're having a blast, dude. What we're doing is we're making history fun. Uh, please come to this museum and see this. Thank you so much. You're welcome. For thank you, show, man. man. It's taken a while for us. It to really pull this but worth it, yeah, worth it, man. You. And, uh, everybody come see this place. It is just fantastic. Thanks for tuning in and leave a review on iTunes and also check out my YouTube channel, Dean Del Rey. The uh, link for it is in my Twitter feed. See ya.